This presentation, uh, Paul, Apostle of the Anarchist, the Invisible Committee, Giorgio Agamben, uh, and uh, anti-terror legislation, is something which in some sense emerged from my earlier books on uh, uh, Paul and the philosophers. Uh, I've been presenting this material um, <laughs> all over, it seems like, um, and uh, on this occasion, uh, we just wanted to make the presentation in order to give a kind of um, a, a, a hello and a tip of the hat to um, uh, four people, three people, um, uh, that I've never written about, um, but whose works and lives uh, mean, and, and I think this is probably how to say it, uh, more than I quite know how to say. Uh, these three people are the theologian and philosopher uh, John D. Caputo, goes by Jack, uh, that speaker and writer who has committed himself to a risky gospel for our time, Peter Rollins, and the writer and founder of a very significant online resource uh, that he calls Homebrew Christianity, uh, Trip Fuller. I hope to write about these three uh, when I'm able. Uh, for now, though, uh, I just wanted to say thanks to each of them uh, for their generosity in making publicly available so many of the talks uh, and, and discussions um, free of charge, as Paul would say. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Christian Amundsen uh, and his collaborators at Syndicate, uh, the online forum for um, uh, debate about new work in political theology, uh, for their creative work in producing uh, new ways to encounter uh, this topic. So, as a kind of modest return on the gift that they've all given, um, I'd like to send uh, out this one uh, in hope that our increasingly, um, uh, well, increasingly uh, potential new and surprising uh, solidarities might reveal themselves. So, Paul, Apostle of the Anarchists. <clears throat> the student says, I guess my question is kind of about radical politics too, you know, like, there is this text I know you're aware of, The Coming Insurrection. It's making the rounds now, and everyone on Zenet is debating, oh, it's nonsense, or oh, it's great. And I was just wondering if you could say a few words about what you presume to be the importance or unimportance of The Coming Insurrection, and also what your position is specifically on insurrectionary anarchism versus revolutionary politics. Giorgio Agamben responds, this book was written by friends of mine, and so it's difficult to answer this question. But this is a peculiar instance of our present situation, when every political radical position which is outside the parliament is immediately nominated as terrorism, because this, these people, for the mere fact, fundamentally, of having written this book, and for other things not sure at all, and which are nothing like a terrorist crime, have been accused of terrorist association, and they risk 20 years of punishment. The problem is that one. Today, in Western so-called democratic countries, every political action outside parliament is, in, is uh, classified as terrorism. This is a great problem, and it has increased. We see it everywhere. Every political activity which is outside the parliament precisely in the moment when the parliament is destitute of any legitimacy, but precisely in this context. Any activity outside parliament is equal to terrorism. That's the model of governance today." Unquote. Uh, that uh, back and forth uh, is from um, uh, the um, uh, lecture of, uh, of Gomben and Butler uh, at the European Graduate School. <laughs> with a very shrewd student um, participating. There is today a carefully managed and perhaps actively suppressed news story about recent philosophical interest in the Pauline legacy. In a word, what are we to do with the evident Pauline affiliations of that anonymous authorial community, sometimes top called Tikkun, and sometimes the Invisible Committee? This collective produced some of the most creatively trenchant and also best-selling and frequently discussed political manifestos of recent decades. For example, uh, Introduction to Civil War, This is Not a Program, and uh, of course, The Coming Insurrection. 
and they did so by amplifying and resituating strong affinities with recent philosophical work on Pauline Messianism. How has it gone unnoticed that their efforts to, to render a protracted or conversionistic call to a radical politics are in central and serially repeated respects articulated through a Pauline legacy, the Pauline legacy as read especially through the Messianic Paulinism of Giorgio Agamben, for example, in his book, his commentary on Romans, uh, The Time That Remains. By the same token, why is it that the Paulinism of these groups has not been discussed in relation to the fact that soon enough after the publication of these widely circulated Paulinist manifestos, this group was threatened with the full force of new French anti-terrorist legislation after a major police raid of, uh, uh, of their commune at Tarnac, France. In his interaction with this perceptive student, Agamben formalizes this event as a name for the governance of our time. As an additional twist of Agamben's proclamation, must we not also say that given the evident Paulinism of the Invisible Committee, our time is therefore also stranded, apparently, within a Pauline tableau, one in which the imperial forces once more threaten the small messianic collective. Even Agamben's offhanded comments to the student repeat what is for Agamben, a Pauline and messianic tableau in which pistis, or trust, becomes the name for an anarchic zone within which positive law and constitutional promise are able to turn against each other, to split apart. In this case, the invisible committee, uh, meaning in Obama's uh, comment above, the invisible committee is definitionally anarchic in the sense that they have articulated a merely trusting solidarity which secedes from a representational form of governance glossed here by Agamben as parliamentarian. Indeed, Agamben often points out that this anarchic splitting apart of the order of law constitutes the modern period as definitively Pauline. This definitive repetition of a Pauline moment being that which, as he writes, causes the Schmidian thesis on political theology to receive further confirmation. As Agamben elaborates, the cesura, or the, the gap, between constitutive and constituted power, a divide that becomes so apparent in our times, finds it the, its theological origins in the Pauline split between the level of faith and that of nomos, or law, between personal loyalty and the positive obligation that derives from it. In this light, Messianism appears as a struggle within the law, whereby the element of the pact and constituent power leans toward setting itself against and emancipating itself from the element of the intole, the, the commandment or the norm in the strict sense. Given the Pauline backdrop of the Invisible Committee and their active repression at the hands of parliamentarian officials, Agamben implies here that such a stark alternative is not just the crisis of contemporary governance, but also the nomological crisis flagged up by Pauline Messianism itself. In the following pages, I would like to begin to counter what has been a strategic lack of reflection on such comparative questions by considering several aspects of the way from anonymous authorial collective to demonized terrorists, so-called, the long and often surreal Tarnak affair brings to light one of the most wide-reaching philosophical efforts to invent a contemporary Pauline gesture. This gesture, this reenactment, this repetition with a particular buzz and vibrancy would found neo-Paulinist communities effectively outside the reach of representational governance, just as they would make important claims about why this sphere elicits the aggressive response of an empire of representational governance. 
One reads the governmental and police documents about the Tarnak affair, like those anxious letters of the Roman uh, uh, Pliny to Trajan. Everywhere are so many civil servants desperately trying to conjure convincing links between the application of power in the field and its images of sovereignty backbone in the architectures of the capital. As you may recall, in 2008, 150 officers descended on Tarnac, a scenic village of only 350 or so in the middle of France. Over the course of several days, the massive police force arrested nine people, finally charging them with, quote, associating with wrongdoers with terrorist aims, unquote. In the rumor mill of, the, of many of the periodicals covering these events along the way, other accusations sometimes pop to the surface, all articulating some kind of terroristic sedition or danger to the, to the state. What is clearer is that police, and presumably anti-terrorism forces, had the Tarnat group under surveillance for an unspecified number of months before the arrests were made. And journalist David Buffrin provides convincing evidence of literally thousands of pages of police surve surveillance documents about Tarnak. According to some reports, the person named by police as the ringleader of the group, uh, Julien Coupa, had previously come to the attention of French authorities after the FBI in the US alerted them that Coupa was present at a protest in front of the military recruitment station where reportedly um, a, a, a cyclist later left um, a, a small um, bomb. No one was injured in the ensuing blast, which broke windows at the recruitment station. But understandably, the occurrence did receive a substantial amount of media coverage at the time. In France itself, not long before the arrest at Tarnac, someone had taken U-shaped bars, apparently something uh, like horseshoes, uh, perhaps the, the descriptions are vague, hanging these on the electric lines of the TGV, or a uh, high-speed train, an action which apparently disrupted communication between trains and which caused delays for thousands of travelers. According to some reports, Coupa and his girlfriend uh, had been stopped and questioned by police shortly before the first train passed the obstructed section of line and this just miles from where the bars were hung up. Despite the entirely circumstantial nature of the evidence against them, the so-called Tarnat Nine were held via mechanisms of French anti-terror legislation, which had been passed rather recently under Nicolas Sarkozy. Most were released within days or weeks, though Coupa was held for six months. Due to a lack of solid forms of evidence against them to substantiate these charges, or indeed other suspicions, one reads the politics of their tracts like a new Corinthian correspondence, hovering somewhere between bluster, threat, utopianism, enthusiasm, and banality. Despite, and uh, perhaps because of a lack of secure evidence against them, a major point of discussion by police and pundits alike during this period of arrest, questioning, evidence gathering, and the spinning machinations of mediated rumor mills was whether Coupa and his friends had in fact authored a book entitled L'Insurrection uh, qui vient, The Coming Insurrection, first published in 2007. Uh, politicians made speeches extracting lines from this text as if to read aloud damning lines to bolster the criminal case against the Karnak, Tarnak friends. Uh, there's some very interesting uh, pictures of these. Uh, 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 things, sometimes politicians reading out uh, uh, lines. Um, here were chapters in that perennially odd spectacle whereby politicians attempt to link a text to an act, not to mention an act which seems in any case not of the order to cause more harm than an annoying delay, a disruption of railway, railway efficiency for the commuters. 
The question of authorship was the focus of many of the public governmental pronouncements about the group, uh, however, and it was a line from the coming insurrection about the neutralization of the TGV line, or high-speed rail, which became a runaway favorite for, go for the governmental orators, cultural pundits, and talk show hosts. The line from the coming insurrection is uh, this one. Information and energy circulate via uh, wire networks, fibers, and channels, and these can be attacked. Nowadays, sabotaging the social machine with any real effect involves reappropriating and reinventing the ways of interrupting its networks. How can a TGV line or electrical network be rendered useless? To be sure, everywhere in France, the governing elite seemed a kind of bustle of offense taken against the coming insurrection, and its often scathing critiques of contemporary culture, a culture that the, the book depicts as a life-sapping social shipwreck in dire need of life-giving reorientation. Fear was expressed, and indeed called for, at the possibility that a homegrown farm town terrorist cell was in the making. After all, how else could one understand this line about the rendering useless of a TGV or high-speed rail? Indeed, as Dufresne points out, not without a smile, was not someone at the commune reading a biography of that old saboteur Neil Ludd a book not mentioned in the extensive police notes about the library of uh, Julian Coupard. Uh, one of the many um, surreal aspects of the documentation around this event um, uh, it, it, um, it includes uh, uh, the, the, the odd um, uh, writing of police notes about the library there, um, which was apparently being used uh, by the group. Um, at one point, somebody made a note that they were reading uh, Hervé's um, uh, Tintin uh, Breaking Free, um, so it is a, a little bit surreal. Uh, in, 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 in memory of such things, I, I've uh, mentioned, uh, or I've cited here, just one of the um, pictures that people have made uh, as an effort to make fun of the uh, invasion of Tornado. In these archival policings, however, not even Dufresne notes that the discussion of rendering anything useless or inoperative, uh, as in the last quotation, is of course a crucial touchstone of the group's fascination with Paul's messianic writings, perhaps the most focused of the Paulinisms of the coming insurrection. Was this public denunciation and parliament of those lines in the book not itself a declaration of war against the Paulinism of the Tarnak friends. After all, as we'll show, the rendering useless of a network of everyday traffic is, in the coming insurrection, one of a panoply of wonders about how to unplug through a kind of situationist performance the everyday function of all aspects of contemporary life. All this was with a view to the transformative wonder, remember the quotation above, about how the new life, the new age, might reappropriate and reinvent our inherited identities and modes of living. And if the Pauline echoes are not already beginning to resound, we should know that this panoply of strategies, the panoply that is the coming insurrection, are summarized in that book with repeated Pauline glosses on the telos, or end of the law, as laws on suspension, neutralization, or productive uselessness. These wonders about the emancipatory messianic time of the TGV location of Paul's reflections on law, on identitarian right in relation to its structured traditions, or even on inherited everyday norms like food laws. On such evident comparative links, however, both the critics and defenders of the Tarnak Nine remained perfectly awkwardly silent. One hears his staged and self-serving rant 
like the sarcastic denunciation of a dangerously superstitious foreign cult by Juvenal. The Coming Insurrection was first published in English in 2009. A fairly quiet print run of the publisher Simeotext. But the affair was destined to become tied into culture wars outside of France in such a way that what may have been a tempest in a foreign teapot would become elevated into um, a coming threat from abroad to the stability of the ways of life and good political sense at home. Strangely, it was such an affected reception, as if in panic and real fury by Glenn Beck of Fox News, which launched the little, little semiotext volume onto the list of major bestsellers in English. Beck set aside time in his editorial show for Fox News to denounce the book on air uh, in July of 2009. Beck's rhetoric was, of course, perfectly streamlined in keeping with the brand, both of his show and of the Fox network. He included the requisite satirical jabs at the French, ominous statements about how the disenfranchised want to bring down capitalism and the Western way of life, assertions that a movement of Paris riots was coming to America, and assurances that the book was intended to foment terrorist acts in the United States. As Beck spoke, an archive of unrelated news shots of burning cars and streams of threatening protesters rolled past on the screen behind him. Beck warned against the dangerous manifesto, but also urged that his audience should read the book in order to plumb the depths of the danger and violent inclinations of what he called the new radical left in Europe. So sure was Beck about this advice that he promised in this same news, Fox News spot to read the book himself during his upcoming family vacation. No doubt the admission in this denunciation that he hadn't actually read the book is comical. Nevertheless, the comedic quality of Beck's satirical performance should not belie the fact that effectively his condemnations were the same as those of the French government, namely, that the anonymous authorial collective was preparing for acts susceptible to the name terrorism. Naturally, Beck claimed that the coming insurrection was the anti-common sense, or the popular, or the polar opposite, rather, of his own revolutionary book, as he calls it, with the unwieldy title, Glenn Beck's Common Sense, The Case of an Out-of-Control Government Inspired by Thomas Paine. In Beck's coming insurrection, we might say, readers were urged to consider, among other things, that handout-prone Democrats as latter-day British tax collectors who must be resisted by latter-day patriots. Encourage, encouraging the Fox News audience to read the coming insurrection was, of course, therefore, also a clear indication that one needed to read Beck's own recent book in order to get a more fair and balanced view. And culture wars being what they are, this figure, my modern juvenile, thus helped to launch his ostensible enemy onto the New York Times list of bestsellers, a list of the coming insurrection soon conquered as its number one hit. The achievement of a great deal uh, to Glenn Beck's denunciation and a great deal to the French government's very comparable reaction. Even while the Tarnak event was becoming a political and cultural affair of the first magnitude, and even as the affair set into motion these types of competition for the rights of valorized cultural legacies, for example, radical or revolutionary, no one seemed to be willing to speculate on the oddly and strategically forgotten Paulinism of the Tarnak group and their associated writings. Actually, a few people did <laughs> reflect on it. 
uh, I've mentioned some of the work they, they have done. Um, uh, it's it's uh, um, uh, not known uh, uh, very widely, but uh, Jean-Marie Glaise and some other friends of the Tarnac group did make some very interesting, uh, very poetic suggestions about uh, alliances between uh, um, uh, the, the Tarnac group um, and, and also the Pauline legacy, various uh, theological uh, traditions, and including um, the Franciscan traditions. Uh, but if you want to know more about that, you have to wait for the published version. Um, one way to approach this issue of the hidden Pauline transcript so to speak, in the Tarnak affair, emerges through Giorgio Agamben's offhand response to the student question about the coming insurrection cited above. Just naively, for example, it's interesting that Agamben calls the authors of the coming insurrection his friends. While I would argue that an Agambenian reading of Paul is everywhere evident in the creative and provocative protrepsis that is the coming insurrection, of the Invisible Committee. Perhaps the affinities between this authorial collective and the work of Agamben are even more evident in some of the group's earlier textual experiments, for example, in Introduction to Civil War. Indeed, even the earlier name of the authorial collective that directly evoked the messianic practices of gathering fragments of redemption, tikkun. Linking two, two favorite topics of Agamben, for example, the Messianic and Civil War, as the paradigm of contemporary political life, the earlier authorial collective summarized this, summarized this way. Tikkun is the becoming real, the becoming practice of the world. Tikkun is the practice of the world. Tikkun is the process through which everything is revealed to be practiced, that is, to take place within its own limits, within its own imminent signification. Tikkun means that each act, conduct, and statement endowed with sense, act, conduct, and statement as event, spontaneously manifests its own metaphysics, its own community, its own party. Civil war simply means the whole world is practice and life is, in its smallest details, heroic. In fact, readers of these earlier writings could be forgiven for wondering whether Agamben himself had written parts of them, given that they are so steeped in his characteristic lines of questioning about messianism, empire, and the rise of a biopolitical imminence of economic power. The point here is for me not at all to make an argument about the authorship of an anonymous and collective text, a speculation which would in any sense be irrelevant for my purposes and uh, also without evidence. But the intellectual solidarities and the affinities, the affinities of topic are worth understanding inasmuch as they point to the remarkable way in which Paulinism exerts over this literature such a massive gravitational force. For example, in keeping with Agamben's agenda, Tikkun's introduction to civil war promises what they call a radically negative anthropology, rather than a positive description of the stable ground of emancipatory critique. The figures of this negative anthropology, moreover, are entirely oriented by the question of singularity or form of life which is opposed to the reduction of ourselves to a generic bare life. A reduction which, of course, washes out our unique particularities or traits in ways that render us susceptible to abstractive managerialisms. Similarly, everywhere in Jakun's introduction to civil war, we see an elaboration of those tactics of suspension of representational or juridical categories those tactics precisely which dominate Agamben's rendering of Paul, in whose hands the apostle becomes a kind of classic, as Agamben says, in the tradition of the neutralization, or rendering inoperative, of juridical, identitarian, and representational forms. 
Moreover, in some of the most important sections of the introduction to civil war are other favorite geneal genealogical questions of Agamben, which most directly bear on his philosophical reception of Paul, especially Foucault's analysis of the rise of biopolitics and the state as a servant of economy, a transformation the introduction to civil war articulates as a repetition of Christian theological themes. Uh, more on that in a moment. Finally, just like Agamben's uh, Paul book, we find in the introduction to civil war the group's main struggle articulated as the fight to inhabit singularities in relation to imperial abstractions which systematically neutralize these. Something that could be read uh, perhaps in relationship to Daniel Boyarin's Paul. They are, to repeat, Agamben's Schmidian story about Paul, struggling for a gesture which convincingly feels like an opposition of the spirit of constitutive power over the dead letter of constituted authority. One could, in fact, read to good effect the introduction to civil war as a kind of application, even a sort of cookbook version, of Agamben's study of Pauline messianism. For example, Agamben found in Paul a thinker of virtual solidarities which were hit upon by Paul's efforts to, quote, divide the division, unquote which otherwise would say separate the Jew from the non-Jew. The introduction to civil war, therefore, becomes formally Pauline when it applies this tactic to contemporary nominations of in-groups. As they write, every attempt to grasp a people as a form of life, as race, class, ethnicity, or nation, has been undermined by the fact that the ethical differences within each people, so-called, have always been greater than the ethical differences between people themselves. This is not simply a reference to the Paulinism of a world in which civil war, rather than, say, fighting against geographical outsiders, is the paradigm of contemporary politics. It's also a striking affirmation of the way that Paul names for these groups the key ind indication of what an inoperative community might look like. Thus, one could reasonably see the introduction to civil war as a kind of expansion and development of Agamben's earlier work on Paul. Paul becomes, in a word, the thinker of civil war before the fact a thinker of that form of cultural conflict which, Tikkun declares, and Agamben too, is the most emblematic contemporary form of social reproduction. The thesis relates to the way all of these texts assert that we are seeing at the moment the sublimation of further, or further abstraction of nationalist and even actively colonialist forms of power. This new empire of power is emerging through new forms of global economic internationalism. Not so much a present representational power capable of enforcing its strategies as it is a diffuse and abstractive capacity to reorient the measures and metrics of life in endlessly proliferating ways. This imagined empire sets the stage on which the everyday heroes, as they call them, heroes of neutralization and singularity, effectively, so many Paulinists, will arise. And when they do, they will emerge replete with Paul's own myth of katakon, or the imperial suppression of chaos. Note the introduction to civil war. It's worth reading in, at, at length. Empire functions best when crisis is ubiquitous. Crisis is empire's regular mode of existence in the same way that an insurance company comes into being only when there's an accident. The temporality of empire is the temporality of emergency and catastrophe. Empire is not the crowning achievement of a civilization. 
the end point of its ascendant, ascendant arc. Rather, it's the tail end of an inward turning process of disaggregation, as that which must check and, if possible, arrest the process of its decay. Empire is therefore the catechon, it's, uh, it's the power that suppresses the chaos. Empire, in this sense, meant the historical power to restrain the appearance of the Antichrist and the end of the present eon, he's, they say, uh, quoting Carl Schmitt. Empire sees itself as the final bulwark against the eruption of chaos and acts with this minimal perspective in mind. And of course, uh, Carl Schmitt is already going back uh, to uh, make reference to um, uh, Paul's uh, Thessalonians correspondence um, and, uh, and the reference to a catacomb there. It's as if the rulers of the present age realized they are indeed undone, neutralized, a realization which spurs them to sublimate their weakness in this way, to supplement it with other reference to this more opaque, abstract, and indeed mysterious form. The story is crucial both for, for Agamben and for his invisible, uh, and for the rather invisible committee as it often signals for them a shift from representational law and the juridical identities of an earlier nation state into something like an imperial and biopolitical eminence of norms. This shift to a mysteriously uncontrollable eminence of this new sublimated power occurs moreover within the same tableau as Schmidt's catechon myth in fact, in the introduction to Civil War, it appears in yet another gesture, uh, uh, in, in yet another gesture, linking the Invisible Committee to the Pauline Thessalonian correspondence. Their gloss at that point on Schmidt reads like this: What do we mean by the imaginary party? That the outside has moved inside. Think of the globalization of uh, uh, national. Um, uh, sovereignties. The outside has moved inside. The turning inside out happened noiselessly, peacefully, like a thief in the night. At first glance, it seems nothing has changed. One is simply struck by the sudden futility of so many familiar things, and the old divisions that can no longer account for what is happening are now suddenly so burdensome. Neither Agamben nor the Invisible Committee signal the specific comparison at this point, but it's worth reading such gestures as similar to what we find in the Pauline political theology of Jakob Taubes. Taubes was clear. The messianic inversions of Paul may be read as a Schmidtianism from below, an effort to appropriate and undermine the neutralizations of legal rights imagined to go along with empire or a sovereignty acting from above within the social food chain. In other words, the Paulinists in view here are seeking gestures by which to appropriate from empire a subversive and self-protective or emancipatory version of empire's own move from the letter to the sublimated spirit of power. Similarly, if for Agamben's paradoxical Pauline messianism from below, as Agamben writes, every vocation is a revocation, every calling is in some sense also a loss of ground, then the singular community of Tukun's introduction to civil war faces the same paradoxes surrounding the impossible closure of self-identity. They write, the moment community tries to incarnate itself in an isolatable subject, in a distinct, separate reality, the moment it tries to, tries to material confronts its own impossibility. This point of impossibility is communion. Put differently, 
Only the paradoxical and decidedly non-organic pistis, or trust, of a Pauline community can indicate the solidarity of the singular, which the invisible committee is urging as a transformative panacea for our current life-destroying submissions to imperial fear and death. Or, in the language of abundance, Paul, all our communities are such inasmuch as they remain alive to the messianic remainder, the time that remains to come. We might also point out that like Paul, these singularities look to as an escape from the global imminence of empire emerged in a Pauline mode through solidarity with the pariah, the outcome. And just to bring us uh, toward a conclusion, they write, all those who cannot or will not conjure away the forms of life that move them must come to grips with the following fact. They are, we are, the pariahs of empire. Anchored somewhere within us, there is a lightless spot, a mark of Cain, filling citizens with terror, if not outright hatred. There are the strays, the poor, uh, the prisoners, the thieves, the criminals, the crazy, the perverts, the corrupted, the overly alive, the overflowing, the rebellious corporalities. In short, all those who, following their own line of flight, do not fit into empire's stale, air-conditioned paradise. Us. This is the fragmented plane of consistency of the imaginary party. This zone of solidarity is, in good Pauline fashion, merely a matter then of pistis, trust. A zone where friendships, as they say, can weave together a non-coercive and in some sense unmeasurable and in that sense anarchic affiliation. Their communicability emerging paradoxically on through the non-natural genealogies or even the incommunicabilities that these genealogies indicate. In the end, the struggle to invent a contemporary Paulinist gesture will have then been, for these groups, about the preservation or recuperation of a messianic pistis or trust. As Agamben had declared earlier in his essay, in praise of profanation, uh, and I'll conclude uh, with this quote, the apparatuses of the media aim precisely at neutralizing this profaning power of language as pure means, at preventing language from disclosing the possibility of a new use, a new experience of the word. Already the church, after the first two centuries of hoping and waiting, began to conceive its function as essentially one of neutralizing the new experience of the word that Paul, placing it at the center of the messianic announcement, had called pistis. Faith. Unquote. Or, to conclude with the Paulinism of Tikkun, this solidarity is a formation, which is what they call a contagious formation, rather than, say, a program to be implemented. Such is the Paulin Pauline gesture here. We are the real children of Abraham. We, the antagonist of empire, whose trust simply is the invisible community, or to say the same thing, the invisible committee.